tales for dark nights. My name is Detective Matthew Prosser. I've been a cop for close to three decades. For the last few years, I worked in the 8th Precinct, Homicide Division. A staff of around uh, 250,000 people can't compete with the murder rate in New York City, but uh, we do our best. To be honest, homicides are usually easy to solve. You don't have to look too far to find a killer because most victims meet their maker at the hands of someone they know. It is a rare circumstance when a murder is perpetrated by a complete stranger. I pride myself that every case I've ever worked resulted in a conviction. I've been banned a thousand my entire career. I was, however, about to open a case that was beyond the typical run-of-the-mill fare. I received a call from dispatch before I had even left my house. Well, house might be a generous term for the shitty little brick two-bedroom ranch I was forced to live in after the divorce. At least the rent was affordable. Anyway, the call came in that a body had been found in an alley next to Callahan's place down in Alphabet City. Since dead bodies normally don't go anywhere until the meat wagon comes calling... I stopped off for a morning coffee. Made a crime scene 15 minutes later. What's the call, Dell? I asked the patrolman on scene as I slipped under the yellow tape. He's still dead. And he shrugged. Nice gray, detective. Get bent, Dell. I stroked my newly grown mustache beard combo. You wish you had it so good. Immediately, I noticed there were no evidence markers littering the alleyway. Only a crushed, bloody, corrugated refrigerator box. No discarded weapons, no shell casings. Whatever the killer used, he packed it out when he fled the scene. Jimmy! I got the attention of the CSI photographer. Are we good to go? Yeah. We're, uh, we're done here. He was distracted, looking at the digital pictures he'd just taken. Never seen anything like it. Like what? His bum got turned into street pizza. Somebody ran him down while he was sleeping in that cardboard box. Probably never saw it coming. You've seen roadkill before. What makes this different? Somebody rolled over this guy multiple times. Definite 480. Jimmy called it. Definitely a cold 480. Felony hit and run. The tread mark showed obvious signs of multiple passes. Somebody really wanted this guy dead. I pulled out my trusty pen and lifted up the edge of the cardboard. Stench of unwashed hobo hit me head on. Dell. <sighs> Get some gloves and give me a hand, would you? Sure, Detective. Officer Dell slipped on a pair of latex gloves. I had him hold up the top of the homeless man's cardboard condo. If you've never seen the effect of a one-ton vehicle landing atop a human being, I wouldn't recommend it before dinner. His head was popped like a basketball filled with canned cranberry sauce. Unrecognizable. The rib cage was most likely touching his spine by the ruptured organ spilling from the chest cavity. Clean bone broken and several places protruded from his limbs. From my initial observation, Jimmy was wrong about one thing. This poor bastard knew what was happening when he died. I carefully picked through his clothing and was rewarded with an expired driver's license that he had tucked in his coat pocket. Holy shit. What is it, detective? I know this guy. The victim's name was Reginald Ingaloo. Reggie was a cop, but he'd been kicked off the force over a decade ago. I spent a little time with him on a vice squad before I transferred to homicide. I wouldn't say he was a dirty cop, but he was lazy and sloppy. The story I got was that Reggie lost a kilo of blow and a couple thousand dollars from a big bust. Since nobody could prove the allegations, he was put on administrative leave, where he proceeded to solicit sex for drugs from a high school girl. Temporary leave became a permanent vacation and would have ended in an extended stay at the Grey Bar Hilton had it not been for the police chief wanting to avoid a serious media black eye. Now, Reggie Ingalube ended his inglorious life as a splatter in an alley that reeked of rotten food and car exhaust. Whatever sins he committed in the past, he didn't deserve a debt like this. Nobody does. Had the text cross-check his prints with the PD personnel database first, I passed the bag driver's license to Dell. I got a feeling it'll save some time. Sure thing, Detective. Contrary to all the TV shows about detectives, there wasn't much to do once the Emmy picked up the body. The homeless shelters I canvassed vaguely remembered him. He mostly kept to himself, drank a bit, never stayed longer than a night or two when the weather got bad. Although some of his fellow street urchins admitted seeing Reggie the day of his murder, they didn't know about that night. 
Before he hit the streets, Reggie was a dedicated bachelor, so there was no family to interview. If there were no family or friends to speak of, who did it? Wasn't likely to have been another homeless person because bums rarely own cars. Besides, the tire marks were from a car with good tread, so who would want to repeatedly run over a disgraced cop? After an eventful day of questions and no answers, I hung it up and headed home. Of course, I kept thinking about Reggie. As I drove, I tried to think of whether a former buddy in the department might have had a grievance with Reggie. Nah, that was as much a dead end as a cul-de-sac where I now lived. And seriously, what cop would wait a decade for revenge? Cops by nature are not very patient people. Sad but true. Tried to distract myself counting all the for sale yard signs that covered my street like wild dandelions. Talk about suburban blight. I came home only to be greeted by a cold house. Not emotionally cold. Temperature cold. Every older home has its quirks and this house definitely had its share. The pilot for the gas furnace had gone out. Again. That meant I had to restart the pilot on the ancient water heater too. I guess I'm lucky I didn't have to venture into some spider infested basement. The house is built like every typical 40s style ranch. One floor, no basement or attic. All I had to do was open a service closet in the kitchen and spark the pilot lights on the rusting equipment. Even though I stopped smoking a year ago, I was glad I kept a few spare lighters for such an occasion. Maintenance done, I poured myself a glass of bourbon and sipped on it while the drone of sports center lulled me to sleep. Still, I couldn't prevent murder scenarios from bouncing around my dreams. Oh, cold showers suck. Poof. I let loose a string of obscenities and headed back to the service closet. In the morning sun peering through the kitchen window, I could see that the pilot light had not gone out on the water heater. Somehow the temperature knob had been turned all the way down. I cranked the dial into the red, but I knew it would take hours for the damn thing to get cooking, so I braved the icy waters of my shower and got ready for another work day. No sooner did I walk through the door than Captain Deacons magically appeared next to my desk with a file folder. Hey, we get anything back on a bum murder? Yeah, I held up the coroner's preliminary report. It was Reggie Ingaloo, vehicular homicide. Lab techs are researching the tire treads we found on the scene. Should have some back today. Good. Deacons dropped the file on my desk. You remember Jace Vark? Yeah, I ran a couple undercover stints with him a lifetime ago. Why? I need you to go out to Sunnyville Trailer Park. He need a ride somewhere, Cap? I knew that was where Jace retired a couple years back. Nah, the coroner's taking care of that. I need you on the scene. I jumped in my car and headed out to the outskirts of town where the trailer park sat. The whole drive out, I thought about Sergeant Jason, Jace, Vark, retired. He was a pretty jovial guy who made up for his limited brain power with elbow grease. He was built like an oak tree with a crew cut. Good guy. Street smart. Dead. I pulled up to the smoldering remains of Vark's trailer. Pieces of double-wide aluminum siding were scattered in a wide berth. Fire Chief O'Kelly and his crew were already sifting through the burnt rubble for clues. What do you say, Chet? Here you Matt. Chief Chet O'Kelly tipped his helmet back. There's a fire. Good one. Yeah, I see that. Any guess how it started? Oh yeah, sure. O'Kelly looked at me with a deadpan expression. Care to share? This was a regular routine in the police-firefighter relationship. Antagonizing each other was in our DNA. Well... He began in his usual cops are idiots tone. What we have here is a complete burn. That means it took less than an hour before the trailer was completely engulfed. Under normal conditions, a trailer like this could go up that quickly, but it's unlikely. He offered me a piece of wood to sniff. Smell that. I nodded. Accelerant. Gasoline? Nah, you feel a little pickling. It's not a reaction to the burnt wood. It's your airway reacting to the accelerant, which in this case happens to be turpentine. And as we know, turpentine is resin made from pine trees. A petroleum-based accelerant like gasoline? Well, it has to rely on its surroundings, or it evaporates quickly. Turpentine, on the other hand, also burns hot and fast, but the resin base allows it to burn longer. Fascinating. So we're looking at arson. What's with the dispersal pattern? Wait, you had a propane stove, right? We might make a decent investigator out of you yet, boy -o. Chief O'Kelly slapped me on the back. Must have been fool. When it hit that tank. Boom. He illustrated by making a mushroom cloud with his stubby little hands. Trailer blown down. <laughs> Thanks, Chet, but I think I'll stick to police work. I'll let you guys play in the dirt. 
I spent the rest of my time on the scene interviewing the inhabitants of Sunnyvale. The balding park manager and his shirtless lackey were of no help. Neither were the stoned or drunk residents that littered the various single and double wide homes. Clearly nobody was talking. Another dead end for a former brother in blue. Back at the station, I milled over the evidence with a large black coffee. I swear the only time I get headaches is on cases like these. I popped a couple of aspirin chased them with the warm caffeine. I set the case files for Reggie and Jason in my in-file box, reclined in my chair, and closed my eyes. You know, for better focus. Detective Prosser? My eyes popped open to Officer Dell standing by my desk with a file in hand. What you got, Dell? The medical examiner thought you should see this. He held out the file. I took the file with a sour look. How about you tell me what it says so I don't have to hunt for my reading glasses? I know you peeked. The coroner's found a correlation between the two victims, Ingalube and Vark. What'd he find? Dale smiled, knowingly. It's not what he found, it's what he didn't find. Cryptic much? Officer spilled the beans like a kid describing his new Christmas toys to friends. The vehicular assault and the fire were the official cause of death, but, but their hearts were removed, and they're missing pieces, like someone took a bite out of them. No shit, I said more as a statement than as a question. I wouldn't kid you, detective. He sounded seriously sincere. The coroner's making bite mark impressions. Thanks, kid. Make sure the captain sees this. Will do, detective. Sudden inspiration smacked me in the face like my morning shower. Do me a favor. Put a parole sheets for the past two weeks. Skip the county stuff and give me the reports from Western Correctional. Dale bonded away like Robin Hood had just invited him to be one of his merry men. The new information gnawed at the back of my brain. I felt like somebody was asking me a trivia question about a TV show I used to watch when I was young, but I just couldn't quite call up the answer. Concentrating only pushed the answer farther from my mental grasp. I knew I knew there was a connection, but damned if I could put a bow on it. The parole sheets cleared up all my cobwebs. Before I moved to the homicide division, I made my detective bones as part of an operation in the vice squad. Back in the day, a violent Mexican gang called the Viento Duero made the Big Apple part of a cocaine cartel pipeline. We estimated these scumbags were using the city as a base of operations to distribute drugs to multiple destinations. We're talking about an operation that pumped millions of dollars in poison across five states. Essentially, they were the head of the drug dealing octopus, and we were determined to make calamari. But it wasn't going to be easy. Our biggest problem was the fear factor that these Mexicans instilled in everyone, including members of our own police force. These sleaze balls would use anything to keep people in line. This included payoffs, intimidation, blackmail, torture, and murder. The worst of them was their leader, Mateo Moreno. His gang nicknamed him Loco Lobo. He stood six foot two, weighed about 285. He was physically imposing, yeah, but it was the darkness behind those brown eyes that could have unnerved even the bravest man. Moreno was known to lead the torture sessions because he enjoyed it. Pain in the eyes of his victims was his drug. When the bodies began to pile up, we knew he was addicted, and nothing could ever satiate his appetite except jail or death. We formed a task force of guys who refused to be corrupted. We were hungry and idealistic, ready to rage against the dying of the light. This was our town. If we failed, anything we had worked to achieve and everything the badge meant would be useful as a car with square wheels. I joined Ingaloop, Vark, and a select few to set the wrongs to right. It took a year before we finally nailed those bastards. I can't tell you how satisfying it was when the three of us took the stand as witnesses for the prosecution. Our case was ironclad, and Moreno could only sit at the defendant's table grinding his teeth. When the gavel fell, Moreno hurled vengeful curses at us as they dragged him away to serve what we thought would be a lifetime in maximum security. Apparently, we were wrong. Five days before Ingalube was murdered, the Ninth Circuit Court quietly overturned his conviction on grounds of uh, evidence tampering. Moreno was free on a technicality, and he wasted no time in his quest to fulfill that bloody promise he made in court a decade prior. How do I know Moreno was a killer? Easy. The heart removals. Lobo told anyone who'd listen that he was descended from Aztec kings. His rulers would conquer their foes and eat the heart of the losing commander. Moreno was batshit crazy enough to do the same thing to his own defeated enemies. Knowing I was the third stop on Lobo's heart munch and comeback tour didn't frighten me. Sure, if I still had a wife and kids to worry about, I might have started sweating. But I'm a crusty old bastard past his pension date. 
I was nothing but the job. No way was this psycho going to punch my ticket. I shared my discovery with Captain Deacons. He wanted to put a patrol outside my house. I declined. It was more important to have as many officers as possible on the streets. Captain didn't argue and issued an APB for Moreno. He told me to check in when I got home, and I agreed, you know, just to appease him. I decided to take the long way home. There's a difference between precaution and paranoia, but I was losing the ability to tell one from the other. Many times in my career I've been called upon to tail a vehicle. Figured the reverse would be just as easy. When I pulled into my driveway, no headlights were in my rearview mirror. I was safe. For now. Needless to say, I didn't waste any time keying open my front door and turning the deadbolt. Remembering my dumb decision to redline my water heater, I checked to make sure everything was okay. I'd seen a Mythbusters episode where they proved a faulty water heater could be dangerous. Damn thing built up so much pressure it blew through three stories after a short buildup. I opened a service closet to make sure my heating equipment wasn't eminently poised to destroy my cramped home. Although I'm sure Renner's insurance would cover any damage. Tomorrow I'd remind myself to go buy a policy. I was quickly distracted by a noise outside. It sounded like a branch scraping a pane of glass. It seemed to be coming from my living room window. I looked through a small window and caught a police cruiser looping the cul-de-sac, honking twice before it headed out to the main row. For once, I was happy the captain lied. I started to close the curtain and consider a glass of chilled bourbon. It was then I caught a weird reflection. Only this was no mirage that confronted me. Ooh la, Detective Brasa. Do you miss me? Mateo Loco Lobo Moreno stared at me through the window. Get the fuck off my lawn. I pulled my 357 service revolver from the shoulder holster. He vanished from the window. I took comfort in the fact that he'd have a hard time trying to shimmy through the window anyway. A freight train slammed into the house. Again, the train landed. I bless my shitty little home for its World War II construction. Unfortunately, I couldn't say the same for my door. I could see the wood shaking loose from the frame and I knew it wouldn't hold much longer. The hinges would give way before my deadbolt. Little bee, little bee, let me in. Not by the graying hair on my freaking double chin, scumbag. I popped a couple shots through the thick wood door. The half-deserted neighborhood seemed quieter than usual. Any good cop or parent, for that matter, no silence means trouble. I slowly drew back the curtain, hoping I'd find a dead hoodlum laid out on my lawn, sporting a couple new holes in his chest. What I saw instead was his massive hand plow through the triple-pane glass window like he was punching through tissue paper. He snagged me by the suit jacket and yelled, I will eat you whole. It was then I noticed his hand had no cuts or glass shards embedded in it. The muscles stretched into tight, thick cords. Lobo's skin turned a deep chocolate color. Brown hair rapidly sprouted across his arm while his fingers lengthened and grew vicious claws. In the moonlight, I could see he had transformed into a beast with glinting yellow cat's eyes and a sharp, toothy grin. A low, guttural growl huffed from his muscled, rippling body and he let loose a howl that iced my soul. I finally understood why his nickname was Loco Lobo. With no time to waste, I took aim and fired until the hammer issued a thick click. Lobo stood there laughing, not a scratch on him. I knew I was not that bad of a shot. I flipped open the cylinder, shook out the shell casings, and reloaded. When I looked through the broken window, he was gone. More damn silence. Not sure if this was the calm before the storm or if I was in the eye of the hurricane, but it was time to take the offense. This was the OK Corral. And I was going to be Wyatt fucking Herb. Hey, Lobo! I yelled at the broken window. You're even dumber than I remember. A real criminal mastermind would have tried the back door first. I could hear movement outside. With an animalistic snort, I heard him start around the house. He had taken a bait. I ran to the service closet, dialed the hot water heater knob all the way into the red and jammed the release valve closed just as I dove behind the breakfast island. And unlike the front door, I knew the back door wouldn't last a couple of shots before it gave up the ghost. Pieces of the flimsy door exploded into the house with such force that some jagged splinters embedded into the drywall. In a doorway, the massive beast stood, nostrils flaring, eyes filled with the fires of hell itself. I leveled my gun and took advantage of the partial coverage the breakfast island afforded. Hold it right there, hairball! I lined him up in my gun sight. 
Time for dinner, he growled. I will buy a snack first. I drew the hammer back on my 357. Moreno howled laughter and moved slowly toward me. He offered a look of confusion when I changed targets and filed a shot into the water heater. The tank's metal skin briefly buckled before rupturing. Over 85,000 psi of scalding water exploded across the tiny kitchen. Luckily, the concussive blast buried me under the uprooted island. The creature howled in pain, taking the full force of the boiling shockwave. Ears ringing from the blast, I quickly dug myself out. The kitchen had turned into ground zero and smelled like wet dog. In the middle of the devastation lay Loco Lobo. Most of his thick animal hair had been blasted away. His body writhed in a mass of third degree burns as he whimpered like a puppy that's been spanked for peeing on the carpet. The big bad wolf looked on helplessly as I picked up a discarded kitchen knife and straddled him. There was no fear or remorse in his glittering yellow eyes as I raised the blade. Only pain and hate. The knife had no problem piercing his seared chest. I cut a long trench under his barrel ribcage and thrust a hand into the warm cavity. The last thing Lobo saw before he died was me taking a big, juicy bite of his still-beating heart. The aftermath was, uh, to say the least, complicated. Captain Deacons had no idea how to write it up without drawing every paranormal investigator and Bigfoot hunter around. So we decided to pretend all the supernatural stuff never happened. We explained the damage away as a tragic accident caused by a faulty hot water heater. The home invasion, Lobo's transformation, and the details surrounding his death were never recorded. We quietly had Moreno's body cremated and pretty much tied a bow on that when we were back to chasing real life perps. Well, not all of us. I was homeless. My little brick house was still structurally sound, but contractors estimated six to eight months to repair the extensive interior damage. I didn't let it get to me. I got flooded with invites from friends for a temporary crash pad. The best of these came from a cute little number who worked down in the records department. Officer Locke had a little place on the lake with a spare guest house. She said I was welcome to stay as long as I liked. Sounded perfect for a much-needed vacation from the grind, so I decided to take Goldie up on her generous offer. Unfortunately, she neglected to mention the bear problems she was having. But, uh, you know, that's another story. During my childhood, my family was like a drop of water in a vast river, never remaining in one location for long. We settled in Rhode Island when I was eight, and there we remained until I went to college in Colorado Springs. Most of my memories are rooted in Rhode Island, but there are fragments in the attic of my brain which belong to the various homes we had lived in when I was much younger. Most of these memories are unclear and pointless, chasing after another boy in the backyard of a house in North Carolina, trying to build a raft to float on the creek behind the apartment we rented in Pennsylvania. But there is one set of memories which remains as clear as glass as though they were just made yesterday. I often wonder whether these memories are simply lucid dreams produced by the long sickness I experienced that spring. But in my heart, I know that they're real. We were living in a house just outside the bustling metropolis of New Vineyard, Maine, population 643. It was a large structure, especially for a family of three. There were a number of rooms that I didn't even see in the five months we resided there. In some ways, it was a waste of space. But it was the only house on the market at the time, at least within an hour's commute to my father's place of work. The day after my fifth birthday, attended by my parents alone, I came down with a fever. The doctor said I had mononucleosis, which meant no rough play and more fever for at least another three weeks. It was horrible timing to be bedridden. We were in the process of packing our things to move to Pennsylvania, and most of my things were already packed away in boxes, leaving my room pretty barren. My mother brought me ginger ale and books several times a day, and these served the function of being my primary form of entertainment for the next few weeks. Boredom always loomed just around the corner, waiting to rear its ugly head and compound my misery. I don't exactly recall how I met Mr. Widemouth. I think it was about a week after I was diagnosed with mono. My first memory of the small creature was asking him if he had a name. He told me to call him Mr. Widemouth, because his mouth was large. 
In fact, everything about him was large in comparison to his body. His head, his eyes, his crooked ears. But his mouth was by far the largest. You look kind of like a Furby, I said as he flipped through one of my books. Mr. Widemouth stopped and gave me a puzzled look. Furby? What's a Furby? He asked. I shrugged. You know, the toy. The little robot with the big ears. You can pet him and feed him almost like a real pet. Oh. Mr. Widemouth resumed his activity. You don't need one of those. They aren't the same as having a real friend. I remember Mr. Widemouth disappearing every time my mother stopped in to check in on me. I lay under your bed, he later explained. I don't want your parents to see me because, you know, <laughs> I'm afraid they won't let us play anymore. We didn't do much during those first few days. Mr. Widemouth just looked at my books, fascinated by the stories and pictures they contained. The third or fourth morning after I met him, he greeted me with a large smile on his face. I have a new game we can play, he said. We have to wait, Shh. we have to wait until after your mother comes to check on you. Because she can't see us play at all. No, 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 no. It is a secret game. After my mother delivered more books and sewed at the usual time, Mr. Wildmouth slipped out from under the bed and tugged my hand. We have to go to the room at the end of this hallway, he said. I objected at first, as my parents had forbidden me to leave my bed without their permission, but Mr. Wildmouth persisted until I gave in. The room in question had no furniture or wallpaper. Its only distinguishing feature was a window opposite the doorway. Mr. Widemouth darted across the room and gave the window a firm push, flinging it open. He then beckoned me to look out at the ground below. We were on the second story of the house, but it was on a hill, and from this angle the drop was farther than two stories due to the incline. I like to play pretend up here, Mr. Widemouth explained. I pretend that there's a big, soft trampoline below this window, and I jump, jump, jump. If you pretend hard enough, you bounce back up like a feather. <laughs> I want you to try. I was a five-year-old with a fever. So only a hint of skepticism darted through my thoughts as I looked down and considered the possibility. Hmm. It's a long drop, I said. But that's all part of the fun. <laughs> it wouldn't be fun if it was only a short drop. If it were that way, you, you may as well just bounce on a real trampoline. I toyed with the idea. Picturing myself falling through the thin air only to bounce back to the window on something unseen by human eyes. But the realist in me prevailed. Maybe some other time, I said. I don't know if I have enough imagination. I could get hurt. Mr. Widemouth's face contorted into a snarl, but only for a moment. Anger gave way to disappointment. Well... If you say so, he said. He spent the rest of the day under my bed, quiet as a mouse. The following morning, Mr. Widemouth arrived holding a small box. I want to teach you how to juggle, he said. Here are some things you can use to practice before I start giving you lessons. I looked in the box. It was full of knives. <gasps> My parents will kill me, I shouted, horrified that Mr. Widemouth had brought knives into my room. Objects that my parents would never allow me to touch. Oh, no, I'll be spanked and grounded for a year. Mr. Widemouth frowned. It's fun to juggle with these. I want you to try it. I pushed the box away. I can't. 
I'll get in trouble. Knives aren't safe to just throw in the air. Mr. Widemouth's frown deepened into a scowl. He took the box of knives and slid under my bed, remaining there the rest of the day. I began to wonder how often he was under me. I started having trouble sleeping after that. Mr. Widemouth often woke me up at night, saying he put a real trampoline under the window, a big one, one that I couldn't see in the dark. I always declined and tried to go back to sleep, but Mr. Widemouth persisted. Sometimes he stayed by my side until early in the morning, encouraging me to jump. He wasn't so fun to play with anymore. My mother came to me one morning and told me I had her permission to walk around outside. She thought the fresh air would be good for me, especially after being confined to the room for so long. The static I put on my sneakers and trotted out to the back porch, yearning to feel the sun on my face. Mr. Widemouth was waiting for me. I have something I want you to see, he said. I must have given him a weird look because then he said, It's safe! Oh, it's safe, I promise. I followed him to the beginning of a deer trail which ran through the woods behind the house. This is an important path, he explained. I've had a lot of friends uh, about your age. When they were ready, I took them down this path to a, a special place. You aren't ready yet, but one day. I hope to take you there. Two weeks after I met Mr. Widemouth, the last load of our things had been packed into a moving truck. I would be in the cab of that truck, sitting next to my father for the long drive to Pennsylvania. I considered telling Mr. Widemouth that I would be leaving. But even at five years old, I was beginning to suspect that perhaps the creature's intentions were not to my benefit, despite what he said otherwise. For this reason, I decided to keep my departure a secret. My father and I were in the truck at 4 a.m. He was hoping to make it to Pennsylvania by lunchtime tomorrow with the help of an endless supply of coffee and a six-pack of energy drinks. He seemed more like a man who was about to run a marathon rather than one who was about to spend two days sitting still. Early enough for you? My father asked with a hint of sympathy. I nodded and placed my head against the window hoping for some sleep before the sun came up. I felt my father's hand on my shoulder. This is the last move, son. I promise. I know it's hard for you, as sick as you've been. Once Daddy gets promoted, we can settle down, and then you can make friends. I opened my eyes as we backed out of the driveway. I saw Mr. Widemouth's silhouette in my bedroom window. He stood motionless until the truck was about to turn onto the main road. He gave a pitiful little wave goodbye, steak knife in hand. I didn't wave back. Years later, I returned to New Vineyard. The piece of land our house stood upon was empty, except for the foundation, as the house burned down a few years after my family left. Out of curiosity, I followed the deer trail that Mr. Widemouth had shown me. Part of me expected him to jump out from behind a tree and scare the living bejesus out of me, <laughs> but I felt that Mr. Widemouth was gone, somehow tied to the house that no longer existed. The trail ended at the New Vineyard Memorial Cemetery, where I noticed that many of the tombstones belonged to children. Yesterday, I had a rare return of energy and positivity. Today, I woke up miserable with all the signs of an oncoming cold. Something about the timing of it had me more agitated than usual. In fact, I was downright angry. My schedule for the last week had been crazy, but somehow I felt more and more alive by the end of it. Yesterday, I wrote down a massive to-do list. I had the energy and attitude to get my life in order to hit the gym, to eat healthy, and to be more ambitious at work. The sudden surge in motivation had been a long time coming, but it was gone in an instant when I woke up with a sore throat. 
I sat at the kitchen table glaring out the window as I waited for my coffee to brew. God damn it! I was beginning to feel like this happened every time. Whenever I finally woke up and beat my bad habits, something would happen to kick me right back in. This time it was a sudden oncoming cold. Last time it had been a sudden inability to sleep. Before that, it had been a sudden case of food poisoning. Stewing over it made me so angry that I began to entertain stranger and stranger ideas. What if life was out to get me? What if reality itself was tuned to keep me down? If that were true, then what had I done during the last week to get the motivation surge from yesterday? As I began going over it in my head, I realized that the busy week had made it impossible for me to do many of the things I normally did. For two or three of the days, I'd hardly eaten, and I'd had way less caffeine overall. Feeling weird, I got up and turned off my coffee maker. Maybe I'd try going without the black stuff for a bit. I went about my morning routine after that. When I returned to the kitchen, the coffee maker was back on. My roommate was there, bleary-eyed and zombie-like, standing over the machine. He mumbled, Want some? I should have seen the signs then. At the time, I thought nothing of it. Maybe it had been a silly idea to try and kick my caffeine habit on a Monday with no warning. I took a traveler's mug with me in the car on the way to work, but a feeling I could not quite articulate hit me every time I tried to take a sip on the commute. I would lift up the mug, smell the coffee within, feel a surge of wakefulness and need, and then put the mug back down without drinking any. It was too much. I needed it, and I didn't want to need it. I just got angry at myself for how desperate I was to drink it. Sitting at my desk that morning, I began to feel the weight of my decision behind my eyes and on my brain. The world felt heavier. My awareness was a boulder tipped on the edge of the cliff of sleep, and I was exhausting myself just keeping it from falling over. A co-worker came by. Hey, bud, woo. got a case of the Mondays. Here, you need this more than I do. He put a mug of coffee on my table. I stared at him until he went away. Then I went to the office kitchen and dumped the coffee out. I wasn't trying to be rude. I just didn't want to have to sit there smelling it and having it weighed on my resistance minute after minute. In the kitchen was a huge tray of bagels, donuts, and random leftover cake from an event that weekend. I approached with a grin until my fingers were just above that last blueberry bagel. It was the last one. It was more valuable. I was tired, so for some reason I needed this. I'm a free, unexpected blueberry bagel would make up for the pain of caffeine deprivation. <laughs> but, but, but why? Why do I need this? <sighs> Sullen resentment joined the burning star of anger under my ribs. Was I really going to just switch from caffeine to sugar for my indulgence this Monday morning? For that matter, why did I hate so much that it was Monday morning? It almost felt like an excuse just to indulge. I sat staring at my computer blankly. I wanted to browse Reddit instead of work, but before I did, it occurred to me that that was just another indulgence. Begrudgingly, I actually started doing my job for the day. But I did jump up reaching lunchtime. It was time to eat. That would help me feel better. I drove to the nearest drive through and studied the menu for nearly two minutes before I realized that everything on it would just make me more tired. It was all heavy. Hamburgers, fries, chicken sandwiches. Uh, I ate this every day of the week and just felt gross and sick the rest of my workday. I tried another chain, but the offerings were the same. This one had a salad option, but it would come with a ton of dressing and processed stuff. I don't know if I could resist using the dressing. I even wasted precious lunchtime going to a grocery store, but I wandered around its aisles in confused horror as I realized that there was literally nothing available that was easily edible but would also not make me tired. As a last resort, I realized I could use the office kitchen to cook something. Nobody had ever done it as far as I knew, because it was awkwardly public and would fill the area with food smells, but I had no other choice. I started looking for extremely basic ingredients. The first box I picked up was expired. So was the second. I didn't want to bother any of the employees, so I just took the freshest expired box and went up front to check out. I chose the self-checkout aisle and scanned my choice. Yeah, the computer didn't react. Not working? An employee asked. She took the box from me and scanned it a few times. Hmm, huh, I guess it's not reading it. So how do I buy it? I asked her. 
I guess you can't. Sorry. Frustrated and out of time, I left the box with her and began to walk out. As I passed her by way of an awkward apology, she said, Monday's right. <laughs> Maybe some coffee would help. That moment crystallized something in me. I stopped, turned, and looked at her. She was serious and sincere. Everyone was. I'd been serious and sincere when I'd suggested coffee to people in the past. I returned to the office and sat on my computer. No longer working, I waited. Whoa, you look sick, my boss said when she came by. Are you feeling all right? I nodded. Maybe get some coffee, she said. You know, a little pick-me-up. There it was. I nodded again. About an hour later, a co-worker came by. Hey, I heard you were feeling sick today. We got some extra Chipotle by accident on lunch order. He left a large foil-wrapped burrito on my desk. I nodded and smiled. And when he moved on, I threw it in the trash. When the clock neared five, I snuck out the back way. Just before I left the building, I peered around a corner and saw my boss and a co-worker at my cubicle, surprised that I wasn't there. Traffic was horrible and the commute was long, but every time I went to turn on the radio, I stopped myself. That was just another way of tuning out. When I got home, I went straight to my room and locked the door. Sleep that night was easy, deep, and incredible. I couldn't believe it. I struggled with sleep every single night of my life. But one day, resisting the weird pressure to tune out and I slept like a baby... <laughs> When I opened my door, my roommate was standing there with a coffee mug. Hey, bro, this is for you. I tried to maintain a mask of politeness. Oh, well, what's this for? Just, uh, didn't see you last night. Thought you might need it. I took the mug graciously. I thanked him and left it on my nightstand. The world felt different. I felt different. Showering... It felt oddly real, and I could feel the individual water droplets in the stream rather than just this numb pressure. My body felt lighter, and, f and for once, the weight behind my eyes was gone. The relief of not having that heaviness there was disconcerting. I mean, was this how humans were normally supposed to feel? I mean, had cavemen walked around feeling decently fine every single day? <laughs> On the commute, I didn't listen to music. I sat with only my awareness and my thoughts. Time passed ever so slowly as a result, but I didn't dare fall back into the flow. At stoplights, I looked left and right, and other drivers stared straight ahead, unaware that I was watching them. Some bobbed their heads lightly to unseen music, but none were awake, not like me. At one light, I watched them all stare straight ahead for nearly three minutes without so much as blinking. That couldn't be right, could it? Yeah, I must have missed them blinking. <laughs> Someone had left an elaborate cake in the office kitchen. Twenty blueberry bagels had been stacked nearby. It all looked mighty delicious. And that was exactly why I didn't take any. My boss came by an hour later. Hey, Starbucks has a barista here. We're about to have a free coffee tasting. Oh, oof. Yeah, I am coffeeed out, I told her. Are you? She tilted her head. You look really tired. Are you still sick from yesterday? I frowned. No, I feel great. It's free, though, and you really should have some coffee. Really? I'm all right. Come on, it'll be fun. I was beginning to feel a little weird about this. No, thank you. Really? I'm fine. Everyone else is going. I said the word a little more sharply than I intended. No. Hmm. Rude. She rolled her eyes and moved on. What the hell had that been about? I looked after her, confused and, and hurt. While the other employees all gathered for free coffee and lemon pound cake, I stayed in my cubicle. Oddly, I wasn't as hungry as I expected. One day without food had not been lethal. I did not require it. In fact, sitting there, feeling light and spry... I realized that eating McDonald's or Wendy's or Chipotle's made me feel tired. And being tired made me feel weak, which made me make poor choices. Like eating heavy food. Eating heavy food led me to eating heavy food again, keeping me tired every single day. Being tired every single day 
made me drink caffeine every single day. What the hell had I been doing all my life? Had I not been outside the cycle of terrible food and caffeine dependence for even a single adult day? A man stopped at my cubicle and regarded me for a moment. I almost didn't recognize him. It was the regional vice president, but he appeared to have gained noticeable weight since I last saw him. His chubby jowls bounced distractingly as he said, Company meeting in the kitchen. I nodded and got up to follow him. The coffee tasting was still going on when I entered, and all 40 of our employees were packed too deep in a ring around the table in the center where the cake was being handed out. It must have been my imagination, but my co-workers seemed darker, somehow. Horrible purple bags were visible under their eyes, and they moved about, slumped and haggard. Richard's hair was thinner, and Marie's face was lined with age. Dean's waistline was two inches bigger than I remembered, and the haircut I liked on my boss the week before, now it looked poorly done. It felt like I was looking at a high-definition television for all that it exposed, flaws and blemishes, and, and suddenly I remembered feeling the individual drops of the shower. Someone passed me a plate with a large piece of cake on it and a plastic fork. The two deep ring of people started devouring their shares with horrible slurping and smacking noises. I stared around in masked horror. Were we all really so slovenly? Had I just gotten used to it? As I gazed around the room, they slowly began looking up at me. The room fell silent, and all those purple-ringed bloodshot eyes turned towards me. Richard asked, Why aren't you eating? Oh, I'm full, I told him. It was the best I could come up with while on the spot. Marie frowned. You didn't eat anything yesterday, either. You're making everyone feel awkward. You're making everyone feel fat, Dean added with anger as he touched his waistline with his free hand and held his cake close with the other. I took an unconscious step back. As a group, they moved forward one step. The regional vice president ordered, Eat some cake. I held my plate a little further away. I don't want to. My boss glared. Eat some goddamn cake. Forty pairs of eyes watched me with vicious anger, as if I'd personally insulted each and every one of them. They were waiting for my reply. I had the distinct feeling that if I said no, they might attack me. But my newly gained freedom was too precious to give up just like that. I threw my cake on the floor and ran for my life. They began screaming like rabid animals and surged after me, knocking down cubicle walls and pouring forth like a river. I screamed too, but in abject terror. What the hell had I done to infuriate everyone around me so much? I darted for the back door of the building and burst out into the parking lot. Two maintenance men were standing a few feet away smoking. They turned and looked at me in surprise, and I came to a shocked halt. Their eyes were dried gray husk, and tar dripped from their noses and mouths. Their skin was thin, so thin, God, so paper thin that I could see their veins and arteries pulsing in their necks. Tumors had grown like bubbles from behind their ears. One said, you all right, man? The other held a hand forward. You look like you could use a cigarette. I'm losing my mind. I screamed at them and at myself. I ran for my car and pulled out of that lot as my coworkers stormed out the back door in search of me. They were all larger now, and they trampled right over the frail maintenance men, splattering their blood and organs in every direction. I looked down from my rearview mirror aghast, but I was not safe on the road. <laughs> How the cars swerved this way and that at random. Within, I could see blind men and women with stumps for hands trying to drive without fingers. No, no, not stumps. Their cell phones had sunk into their skin and festered, not blind. Their heads were simply held down at an angle by veins that had grown out of their infested hands. I screamed at them to get away from me, but they couldn't hear me. I sped on trying to get away from them, but there were everywhere. A cop car turned on its lights and turned onto the road behind me. That finally broke through my terror and I pulled over to the side of the road. The police, yeah, the police would help. <laughs> yes, I could tell them what was happening and I could get help. He looked normal as he walked up to my car. Yes, 
My delusion was passing. License and registration, please. I got out my wallet, but he reached in through my open window and took it out of my hands. He began rifling through. He took my cash and threw the wallet back in past me. I tried to protest. Hey, what are you- He shouted. Stop resisting! The next thing I saw was a nightstick arcing towards my face. Darkness found me. Darkness and pain. I awoke in the hospital. That weird feeling of high-definition sight and texture was gone. I sat for a time just recovering my senses and feeling out the pain in my head. Apparently, I was not too horribly wounded, and, and I hadn't lost any teeth. What had I done? God, I must have had an episode. A fit. Oh, my co-workers probably thought I was nuts. Yeah, I was bored, and there was a television in the upper corner of my room, but I resisted turning it on to pass the time. Which seemed like an eternity later, only five minutes or so in reality, a doctor came in. I was relieved to see that he looked normal. His hair was nicely kept, he was fit, and he bore an expression of empathy. Hey there, how are you doing? My mouth was dry, but I coughed a little and then said, What happened? Seems like you tried to go cold turkey off caffeine and sugar, he told me compassionately. And you didn't eat for a few days at the same time. Bad recipe. Apparently you really flipped out there for a minute. Oh god, it was true. I had some sort of a nervous breakdown. I must have freaked everyone out. Your co-workers, they're actually all here, I believe, out in the waiting room. They're all very worried about you. I couldn't believe it. Really? Yeah, you didn't hurt anybody if that's what you're worried about. You just panicked and ran for your life all of a sudden. <sighs> that was a relief. I looked at the tubes running down to my arm. Saline solution and electrolytes. Just a neurochemical imbalance from too much dietary stress all at once. I nodded. Man. I saw the craziest things. His compassionate expression felt a neutral concern. What? What is it? He shook his head. We, uh, <clears throat> haven't given you any caffeine yet, which you probably should get some sometime soon. And you probably shouldn't mention anything you, uh, that you saw. My relief turned to worry. Why? He glanced down at the floor, then pressed his lips together unhappily, turned and left the room. A nurse came in a few minutes later and helped me up. I was shaky, so she gave me a wheelchair and rolled me out toward the waiting room. As I approached, I saw all of my co-workers standing there with concern. They really all had come out to see me. But as I got closer, I wondered, why? Surely they hadn't stopped the entire company for the entire day just to sit and wait for my recovery at the hospital. Once I got close enough, I began to understand. Dean was there, and his waistline was a foot wider than in my delusion. Marie was a decrepit old woman with rotting teeth. Richard was almost completely bald, with a few scraggly stray hairs angled randomly from the corners of his scalp. Here we all were, and I was not hallucinating. Each and every one of us was a horrifying, unhealthy mess, and... <laughs> What did that mean for me? What did I look like? I began to look down at my hands, but creeping horror shook me forcefully as I began to take in the rotting bits of flesh on my arms. We brought you a coffee and a blueberry bagel, my boss said, leaning forward to hand them to me. Her teeth were uneven, and she had a double chin I never noticed before. My co-workers waited with bated breath. Their expressions cried, Please. 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 Though they said nothing out loud. I took the coffee in one hand and the bagel in the other before I looked up at the nurse behind my wheelchair. Haunted in a permanent and traumatized sort of way, she nodded absently down at me. With relief, I wolfed down that bagel in ten bites and guzzled half the coffee. I closed my eyes and took a deep breath. When I opened them, everything was back to normal. Dean looked great. Marie was beautiful. Richard had a full head of hair and I was one of the gang all over again. I smiled. I'm glad you're all here. I can't believe it. 
They rushed forward with relief and excitement to hug me and wish me well and tell me how worried they'd been about me. A slick, cool man emerged from the crowd. It was the regional vice president. Looking good, just like I remembered. We're all a family in this business. How about a night out at karaoke? I'm the company. Everyone cheered and ribbed each other and they swept me up to my feet again. It was such a relief to leave my delusion and terror behind. Reality is a tenuous thing, I knew then. It had to be carefully defended and cultivated. Even something simple like a dietary imbalance can cause you to become paranoid and see horrible things. I turned back to the nurse to give thanks and say goodbye. She looked despondent, like she could use a pick-me-up. Hey, want the rest of my coffee? She turned away without reply. Huh. Rude. Rude. A kleptomaniac is a person who can't help but steal, and they can almost be forgiven for it. Me? Well, I'm a thieving bastard. I don't have to steal. I don't need to. But I like to. I don't have any excuses either. An excuse would suggest that I felt in some way guilty. Which I don't. Not me. If a shop or store doesn't have the right security or some idiot doesn't have his wallet in his inside pocket, well, uh, then they pay a stupid tax. About three years ago, I was taking a walk along the high street when I noticed a new shop had opened. It was a small bric-a-brac shop full of the normal old furniture, paintings, timepieces, and old coins you'd expect to find in such a place. Walking in, I noted only one old man behind the desk, and after a few minutes concluded he was the entirety of the staff. Yeah, it was time for me to have a little fun. I found a small pocket watch, which felt old, cast iron, and almost industrious. That'll do, I thought, turning to see that the lone shopkeep was even kind enough to have his back to me. Think about it. Here he is. He's new in town. Just opened shop and won't even acknowledge his first customer. Well, his tough luck, I thought, as I pocketed the watch and calmly strolled to the door. I think the phrase is blunt force trauma, but I'm not sure. What I am sure of is that getting a big oak table leg wrapped around the back of my head was both blunt and more than a bit traumatic. I was probably only down for a minute or two, but by the time I was back on my feet and a bit more with it, the shop owner was between me and the door, holding the biggest fucking knife I'd ever seen. Boy, you want to make sure you know who you're stealing from before you try. You put, you put that watch in your pocket and clear side of my little camera. Right there. He pointed to where he previously stood, where I thought he couldn't see me. Pointing at the wall, he revealed a security camera. That pointed right at the spot where I had pocketed the watch. You even walked slow enough for me to turn the camera off and grab some to brain you with, you silly little shit. I was caught, hands down. I asked the shop owner and, I must confess, a very pathetic voice, if you'd call the police. He replied in a softer voice this time. Son, I got you red-handed and old tape. <sighs> Here's the deal, son. I have a close friend who is a parish priest of the church up at the top of the high street. What I want you to do is to go confession. Tell him not just about today, but about all your sins and carry out your penance. I'll call him and say he should expect you there tonight at night. The shopkeeper, an old graying man, but well over six foot five with a big frame and also holding a massive knife, had given me a pass. All I had to do was go to confession, tell the priest my sins and knock out a few Hail Marys. Oh yeah, I agreed. We amazingly exchanged a polite goodbye, and I was out. Thinking about what happened made me laugh as I walked home. It had been just under a year since the last time I was caught, and instead of spending a few months all expenses paid in a lovely prison, all I had to do was an evening down at church. 
Nine o'clock rolled around and I found myself sitting in the small confession booth. It took Greasy Boy forever to begin. Well, for ten minutes at least, I could feel his gaze through the cross-hatched partition in the booth. Now, I'll be honest, it was a little unnerving. Eventually he spoke. You may begin when you are ready, my son. At that moment in time, for some reason, the shop owner's words came to my mind, and I decided to have some fun. Bless me, father, for I have sinned. It's been eighteen years since my last confession. At the twenty-minute mark, I could tell old priesty boy was getting more and more impatient for me to finish confessing, oh, in vivid detail, every single thing I'd ever stolen. I ended at the eighty-minute mark, feeling quite content at being able to gloat about, oops, sorry, confess about all my sins to someone who was duty-bound to sit and listen. Is that all, my son? He spat out in a far less content voice. Yes, father, it is, I replied in a chirpy, smug voice. Now, how many prayers is all that gonna set me back? I asked. That's when it went a bit crazy. The priest opened the partition and stared at me for a minute or so. Eyes squinting and face screwed up in what I thought was a temper. He held out his right hand and said, Take this, my son. Handing me a black stone rosary. Your penance is within these beads, and will take you five years. I laughed, counting that there were sixty beads, and what I guessed was supposed to be Jesus at the bottom. So, what? I have to say one prayer a month, or sixty prayers a day... What prayers am I meant to say? Anyway, the, our Father, Hail Mary, the glory be, I asked the priest, putting the rosary around my neck. Old priesty boy's face slowly began to unscrew, and his eyes began to widen. His mouth turned from a scowl into a grin, and it frightened me to my very soul. The priest, now adopting a sarcastically quizzical tone, said, Glory be, Hail Mary. <laughs> no, 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 my son. <laughs> Prayer has no place here, nor does the Virgin Mother, the Saints, or the Savior, or the Father. As the words left his mouth, I began to feel the beads of the rosary become coarse. In vain, I tried to remove the now stuck fast chain. The Trinity and its angels and the prayer and the mercy are no longer for you, my son. Have you ever felt so scared? that it felt almost like a fire spreading up through your veins, from your chest out to your limbs. The baseline shot of terror that hits you in an instant of shock, but instead of fading, holds tight its grip on you, almost pushing your blood vessels to burst under the pressure. Yeah, well, that's how I felt. Fighting the bile, coating the base of my throat, I managed to ask, So what's my penance? The priest coldly put his hand on my shoulder. Once a month... You must kill somebody, and not just anybody. It must be someone who has shown you kindness. You must kill them, and bring me their heart. Maybe my fear hit critical mass. Maybe my survival instincts began to kick in, or mi maybe I am indeed just, just a bastard. But after he told me this, I began to think in a sadistic but logical way. I was still scared, but my logical thoughts were telling me I was in no position to get myself out of this. If the ever-burning feeling on my chest coming from the beads was as immovable as they felt, and with that being the case, I thought I'd better get the ground rules for this setup clear. I took a deep, labored breath and began to ask Priesty Boy a few questions. Four questions, to be exact. My first question was, well, what would constitute an act of kindness? The priest answered that it could be anything from a doctor's treatment to a kind word. My second question was, who exactly is the figure on the base of the rosary? As I'm pretty sure by now that it's not fucking Jesus. The priest answered, that, son, is your new lord, our lord. And you would do well to hold him in reverence. The third question I asked was, What happens to me if I fail? His eyes lit up with sadistic glee as he answered, 
each of the beads on your chest are, as you by now well aware, embedded into your chest. They will continue to embed themselves further and further into your chest until they reach your heart. And I am sure I don't need to tell you what will happen when they do. Oh, not to worry too much, my son. It will take five years to reach your heart. But for every heart you bring to me, one of the beads will drop out of the chain and out of your chest harmlessly. The chain and the symbol of our Lord, however, will remain harmless, but forever with ye. And my son, to answer your question, if you should fail, then you will be before the Lord himself, and will have to answer to him. Let me warn ye, our Lord has no time for compassion or for second chances. That sure as hell cleared that up, didn't it? For a minute or two I stood before the priest and simply wept. Wept of the hopelessness of my situation. Cried for my fate. Hot, wet tears ran down my cheeks as I thought of the fate that awaited me should I fail in this horrid, hellish task. But after that, though, I think I must have cracked. I felt hopeless. Resigned my fate. And the only thought left in my head was, I'm sure I can make something from this. With this thought, I ask my last question. So if you just, if you just want the heart, and I have the rest, the money, valuables, you know, all that. Old priesty boy smiled and said, My son, all I want is the heart. Once I have that, no one will investigate their death or even remember the wretched soul. So, by all means, take whatever you want. The priest gave me a small wooden box. The box was ebony and had a latched lock, a red velvet lining, and a plain wooden handled knife inside. My last instructions before I left were that I was to return within four weeks with a human heart within the box. The heart had to be cut from the body with this knife and this knife alone. Old priesty boy assured me that once the heart was in his possession, then there would be no repercussions for the murder, and as he stated before, what I did with the human and material remains were of absolutely no interest to him. The first one was hard. I had to keep my now counterproductive humanity in check whilst I found someone to be kind enough to me that would allow me to kill them. It took me two weeks of thinking and nerve-building to do my first. A homeless shelter. I arrived, unshaven, clothes ripped, and stinking to high heaven. The man at the desk asked if I needed any help and was more than kind enough to show me to where I could bed for the night. I slept in the shelter for three nights, in the stench and the lowliness of humanity's wretches. I hated them. Too stupid or too proud to steal, but pathetic enough to beg at some master's table. Two days and nights I was there. That's how long it took me to work out the desk worker's shifts and where he parked his car. Two days to work out where he lived. I'm not bad at this. He was an old, short man. He had such a warm and caring smile. He folded like cheap lawn furniture when I belted him with the handle of my knife. He had just unlocked his door and was halfway through the threshold when I did it. Seconds it took before I was inside, door closed and locked behind us. I kicked him in the jaw first. Couldn't have him making noise now, could I? After a few boots to the head, he passed out, and I got the box open and ready. I cut his throat and left him to bleed out while I searched his house for money or something to fence. Three hundred bucks and a gold watch. Not bad. Now, if you think anything like me, I'm sure you're thinking two questions, and I'll answer them both. First, yes, I did leave him to bleed out, so the heart would not be beating and there would be less chance of botching the removal. Clever. Second, no, I didn't think to get his ATM card and pin before I cut his throat. Not so clever. But it was only my first. I knew better for the next time. 
the second one. Again, a homeless shelter. This time I had to only endure the place for one night before following the nice young volunteer home. She must have been in her late twenties. Oh yeah. I think mommy and daddy must have been paying her way for her whole little life because she had one hell of an apartment that was within walking distance. Now, I'm not making fun of her for being a pampered little shit, no. I mean, he got me 700 bucks from her apartment and 2100 from her ATM card throughout the week. This second one got me thinking. No, n not about that. And I told you, I don't have excuses. If people don't check behind them when they unlock their door, or don't know how to disarm a man with a knife, well, yeah, they pay stupid tax. No, it got me thinking that I should be hitting rich people. What the priest had told me about the lack of repercussions was right. I'm even still living in my eighth victim's house as we speak, typing this shit out. What I had to do was find a way of getting very well-off people to be just a little kind to me. Then I could cut out their heart and harvest their wealth. I mean, the answer was easy. Manners. People are so stupid for manners. It can just be a thank you for holding the door open. Or getting on the bus with a crutch and somebody giving up their seat for me. Although I'll be honest, bus kills are not very profitable. But mainly I hit the big posh hotels or hospitals. A lot of money in hospitals. Doctors find it hard to refuse helping people. Fuck, the actors are the jackpot. Fifteen hour shift, follow them home, and they're far too tired to put up a fight. Whew. I love doctors. So caring. So kind. So rich and easy and weak and as pathetic as the rest of them. You may think I'm a bastard, but you have to admit, I can make the most of a bad situation. Truth is, I wouldn't change this life for the world. I get to steal and kill, and I never have to worry about the law even looking for me, let alone catching me. Now I treat it like a job, but the kind of job you wake up to in the morning and you can't wait to get to. I love the feeling of cold steel piercing weak flesh, the gurgle in the throat. Ah. <laughs> and I am so close to being able to look at the pathetic Why me? expression on their faces without feeling hatred for them. Close, but not there yet. Now then, I'm nearing the end of my little confession, and I will answer the question that by now you must be asking yourself. Why confess? Yep. The answer is simple. Ego. I am now the world's greatest thief. And nobody knows about it. <sighs> yeah, but anyway, that's my cross to bear. We mustn't grumble at life's hardships now, must we? Oh, thank you, by the way, for taking time out of your life to read my little chunk of memoirs. It was very kind of you. Thank you. You have been very kind. Nyarlathotep, the crawling chaos. I am the last. I will tell the audience void. I do not recall distinctly when it began, but it was months ago. The general tension was horrible. To a season of political and social upheaval was added a strange and brooding apprehension of hideous physical danger, a danger widespread and all-embracing, such a danger as may be imagined only in the most terrible phantasms of the night. I recall that the people went about with pale and worried faces, and whispered warnings and prophecies which no one dared consciously repeat or acknowledge to himself that he had heard. A sense of monstrous guilt was upon the land, and out of the abysses between the stars swept chill currents that made men shiver in dark and lonely places. There was a demoniac alteration in the sequence of the seasons. The autumn heat lingered fearsomely, and everyone felt that the world, and 
Perhaps the universe had passed from the control of known gods or forces to that of gods or forces which were unknown. And it was then that Nyarlathotep came out of Egypt. Who he was, none could tell. But he was of the old native blood and looked like a pharaoh. The Felahin knelt when they saw him, yet could not say why. He said he had risen up out of the blackness of twenty-seven centuries, and that he had heard messages from places not on this planet. Into the lands of civilization came Nyarlathotep, swarthy, slender, and sinister always buying strange instruments of glass and metal, combining them into instruments yet stranger. He spoke much of the sciences, of electricity and psychology, and gave exhibitions of power which sent his spectators away speechless, yet which swelled his fame to exceeding magnitude. Men advised one another to see Nialatotep, and shuddered. And where Nialatotep went, rest vanished, for the small hours were rent with the screams of nightmare. Never before had the screams of nightmare been such a public problem. Now the wise men almost wished they could forbid sleep in the small hours, that the shrieks of cities might less horribly disturb the pale, pitying moon as it glimmered on green waters gliding under bridges, and old steeples crumbling against a sickly sky. I remember when Niala Totep came to my city, the great, the old, the terrible city of unnumbered crimes. My friend had told me of him, and of the impelling fascination and allurement of his revelations, and I burned with eagerness to explore his uttermost mysteries. My friend said they were horrible and impressive beyond my most fevered imaginations, that what was thrown on a screen in the darkened room prophesied things none but Nyarlathotep dared prophesy, and that in the sputter of his sparks there was taken from men that which had never been taken before, yet which shewed only in their eyes. And I heard it hinted abroad that those who knew Nyarlathotep looked on sights which others saw not. It was in the hot autumn that I went through the night with restless crowds to see Nyarlathotep, through the stifling night and up the endless stairs into the choking room. And shadowed on a screen I saw hooded forms against ruins, and yellow evil faces peering from behind fallen monuments, and I saw the world battling against blackness against the waves of destruction from ultimate space, whirling, churning, struggling about the dimming, cooling sun. Then the sparks played amazingly around the heads of the spectators, and hair stood on end whilst shadows, more grotesque than I can tell, came out and squatted on their heads. <laughs> and when I, who was colder and more scientific than the rest, mumbled a trembling protest about Imposter in static electricity. Nyarlathotep drove us all out, down the dizzy stairs into the damp, hot, deserted midnight streets. I screamed aloud that I was not afraid, that I could never be afraid. And others screamed with me for solace. We swore to one another that the city was, it was, exactly the same, and still alive. And when the electric lights began to fade, we cursed the company over and over again and we laughed at the, the queer faces we made. I believe we felt something come down from the greenish moon, for when we began to depend on its light, we drifted into curious, involuntary formations and seemed to know our destinations, though we dared not think of them. Once we looked at the pavement and found the blocks loose and displaced by grass, with scarce a line of rusted metal shoe where the tramways had run, and again we saw a tram car alone, windowless, dilapidated, and almost on its side. When we gazed around the horizon, we could not find the third tower by the river and noticed that the silhouette of the second tower was ragged at the top. Then we split up into narrow columns, each of which seemed drawn to a different direction. One disappeared in a narrow alley to the left, leaving only the echo of a shocking moan. Another filed down a weed-choked subway entrance, howling with a laughter that was mad. My own column was sucked toward the open country and presently felt a chill which was not of the hot autumn, for as we stalked out on the dark moor we beheld around us the hellish moon glitter of evil snows, trackless, inexplicable snows, swept asunder in one direction only, where lay a gulf all the blacker for its glittering walls. The column seemed very thin indeed as it plodded 
dreamily into the gulf. I lingered behind, for the black rift in the green laden snow was frightful, and I thought I heard the reverberance of a disquieting wail as my companions vanished. But my power to linger was slight, as if beckoned by those who had gone before, I half floated between the titanic snowdrifts, quivering and afraid into the sightless vortex of the unimaginable, screamingly sentient, dumbly delirious. Only the gods that were can tell. A sickened, sensitive shadow writhing in hands that are not hands, and whirled blindly past ghastly midnights of rotting creation, corpses of dead worlds with sores that were cities, carnal winds that brush the pallid stars and make them flicker low, beyond the world's vague ghost of monstrous things, half-seen columns of unsanctified temples that rest on nameless rocks beneath space and reach up to dizzy vacuum above the spheres of light and darkness. And through this revolting graveyard of the universe, the muffled, maddening beating of drums and thin, monotonous whine of blasphemous flutes from inconceivable unlighted chambers beyond time. The detestable bounding and piping whereunto dance slowly, awkwardly, and absurdly the gigantic, tenebrous, ultimate gods, the blind, voiceless, mindless gargoyles whose soul is Nialatotep. To start off with, I now reside in a completely different state after leaving my job with the Walt Disney World Resort in Orlando. I used to be what some would describe as a suit. I'm one of the guys that walk around the park in plain sight, yet hidden to the public. I'm part of the elite group of black polo sporting undercover security officers that specialize in worse things than shoplifters and unruly park guests. You see, if you're at Disney World and you see more than a few guys in one place wearing black polos, then you're most likely in danger and you should leave the area immediately. The sad part is, we're so good at blending in with the woodwork that you wouldn't even notice us. Anyway, let me cut to the chase here. I've seen some pretty weird things at Disney World during my time. The so-called anomalies that everyone speaks of? Well, they're true, but the least of our concerns. See, the thing is, when you take hundreds of thousands of people and cram them into a relatively small space, weird shit is going to happen. We've had kids, adults even, get lost in the park. Cryptozoological sightings, alien sightings, ghost sightings, you name it. We've seen it. Generally speaking, unexplainable things happen all the time. At the height of my time there, I was a senior special security officer and I got called for some pretty dark shit. Many of you imagine we, as in the security detail I was in, were covering up for Disney Corp. But in actuality, we were damage control and were kept out of the loop on things and were trained not to question, but to diffuse. There was one thing, though, that still bothers me to this day. One day, a cast member, as the Disney staff are called, rang us on the next tell to report that a group of four children had gone missing on an eerily calming nature ride called Living with the Land. Another one of those anomalies, I figured. The odd thing about the cast member's report was that up until that point, my team and I had never received that particular type of complaint before. Of course, that made no difference. We had protocol to follow. As per usual, we were issued a cover story from higher up and asked to recite it to any witnesses to the events, both cast members and guests alike. Alan, a colleague of mine, recited the official narrative to the cast member who had called in the incident. Calmly, he explained it to her that the kids they had seen were part of an educational program and that they had exited the boat with a guide and had been escorted into the botany lab that exists on the ride. I approached the cast member myself then, and advised her refrain from speaking of the incident or asking any further questions, so as not to spread fake news. Then Alan escorted her to a nearby security office to be debriefed and to sign a few forms. A new cast member, unaware of the details of the incident, arrived shortly afterwards to replace the one who had made the report. At that point, my curious nature had gotten the better of me and I approached the cast member telling him I needed him to put some space between the next two boats as I would be searching for a lost wedding ring. He bought my explanation and a few moments later, I caught the next boat and entered the ride. 
alone. Now, for those unfamiliar with the ride, living with the land is boring and not particularly popular, so the fact that kids had been alone on the ride at the time of their disappearance was not surprising. It was also the reason I was certain no one would see what I was about to do. A few minutes into the ride, I came to the part of it which features a realistic prairie farmhouse. I don't know what it is about the scene, but no matter how many times I've seen it for myself, something about it just never sat right with me. In any event, as I had done hundreds of times before on rides, I jumped off the boat and into the set where the house was located. That's when I noticed something unusual. There were no pressure mats, and the boat drifted away. A solid 30 seconds passed before the next boat arrived at the scene. Until that point, I had never seen a ride with its pressure mats disabled. For the unaware, the mats are used to detect if and when anyone disembarks a ride. I shrugged it off and slowly I started to walk up to the house. Climbing the steps up to the porch, I noticed a small emblem on the left window. A small square and compass which I immediately recognized as a Masonic symbol. Interesting, I thought, that it had been hidden there of all places. I figured whoever built the ride was a Freemason and brushed it off. I looked in the windows of the house and saw that there was nothing but curtains with black plywood behind them. It seemed as though there was nothing to see but something deep inside me encouraged me to keep looking. The front door glided open to a bright room with the black and white checkerboard floor. There was a marble, altar-like table on the opposite end of the room with some kind of weird throne-like chair built into the front of it and a golden cup atop the table. The only other thing of note was a heavy wooden door on the other end of the room. There were no windows. The sight was beyond strange. I'd always been under the impression that the house was fake. Again, I was overwhelmed with curiosity. Against my better judgment, I tried the door in the room. Not surprisingly, it was locked. Refusing to take no for an answer, however, I tried my keys, but none of them worked. Here's the thing. At Disney, we use a lock system called BEST, which utilizes interchangeable cores which have assigned numbers or letters or a combination of them. This allows us to limit access to certain areas. I have the general master key, which is, essentially an honest-to-God key to the kingdom. The interesting thing about this lock was that my master didn't open it. I inspected the lock more closely. Sure enough, it was the best lock. However, the inscription on it read CC, which I'd never seen before. Having hit a dead end, I turned to leave. On my way out, I noticed a fast pass for another attraction, Soren, lying on the ground. I picked it up and pocketed it. It's amazing how trash works its way into odd places, I thought. I was determined to figure out where the kids went. I rode the boat back out to the platform and went back to the Epcot security office to replace some footage from the DVR. It took a while, but I was able to zero in on the exact moment when the missing kids had entered the land and sea pavilion and followed them. There were four of them total, three girls and a boy, and a fifth person, a man, escorting them through the building. I watched as the group lumbered through the pavilion in a straight line. The girls' actions were unusually robotic. Simply watching them sent a chill up my spine. What frightened me the most, however, was their unidentified male escort. I paused and looked closer when I realized the man, like me, was outfitted in a black polo and khakis. Holy shit, I thought, realizing I recognized him. It was my colleague, Alan the guy that arrived at the scene before I did. The same guy who fed the cast member at the control podium BS about the kids going on a tour. For a moment, I thought maybe he had actually sent them on the tour of the botanic lab and lost track of them. Until I hit play on the film. On the screen, I watched as the boy refused to walk in line. I could tell he was giving Alan problems. He kept venturing away and getting distracted by various things in the pavilion. Until then... I had given Alan the benefit of the doubt. That changed, however, when I saw the kid press the button for the fast pass on Soren and retrieve the paper like it was some sort of prize. Alan tugged the boy away and stood back, observing the other kids as they made their way to living with the land. I saw everyone get on the boat. They remained visible throughout the storm scene, through the rainforest scene, then through the desert scene. After the desert, I lost sight of the boat. I noticed then, as verified from the other scenes, that the ride had stopped momentarily. 
Once it resumed, I saw the boat re-emerge in the scene with the pictures of farmers. It was empty. I also saw Alan looking down from the observation deck, which explains how he'd been able to respond so quickly. I switched the cameras back to live view and left the area. Now, I haven't been exactly honest with you thus far. I know about a lot of things Disney does. About things that my team responds to, which a regular security officer wouldn't deal with. I've witnessed eugenics experiments, pharmaceutical engineering, even experiments with gas. Have you ever noticed that on both Spaceship Earth and the monorail, that you get a strange, calm feeling on those rides? Now, well, they're pumping low doses of laughing gas in those areas. Ever heard of Room Zero? They were wearing gas masks for a reason. Ever hear of gas gots? Well, that's not important right now. But I would encourage you to research it. I know I'm the bad guy. I never thought that what we did by containing these dark secrets was okay. But the job paid well. And so I kept my mouth shut when I witnessed guests being injected with experimental drugs and released. After which point it was our job to monitor and contain them if things got out of control. All things considered, what I saw the day of the kid's disappearance wasn't procedural. It wasn't normal, relatively speaking. So the first thing I did was go over to the room where we kept the keys. I looked through the logbooks for the core labeled CC. I found it, but it had no zone or specific location issued to the core, and the number of copies was marked as 1. The key was in our system, but my master key didn't open it. So I grabbed the core key and a few Zone 1 cores. The core key is a specific key that when inserted into the lock, removes the core so it can be replaced with another. I put it in my pocket and made a beeline for the land and sea pavilion. I might have been paranoid, but I swear I saw Alan following me in the shadows. I got to the ride and made my way to the house and back to the front door leading to the Masonic room and locked the front door as I entered. I inserted the core key into the lock on the wooden door, removed the core, and inserted the Zone 1 core back into the lock. Now my master key would open the door, and boy did it ever work like a charm. The door glided open. It was heavy, with steel opposite its wood face. On the other side of the door, I discovered a red velvet staircase leading down to some kind of utilidor. For the unacquainted, the utilidors are short for utility corridors. They're a part of the backstage area in Disney's theme parks, and their purpose is to allow cast members to perform park support operations, such as trash removal, out of the sight of guests, so as to avoid ruining the illusions of perfection the company tries so hard to create. What the hell, I thought. We were in Epcot. There was one small utilidor in Epcot, but it didn't go that deep. Slowly, I descended the stairs and walked down the red-carpeted hallway to a pair of double doors. Behind those doors was the answer I'd been searching for. The truth of what happened to the kids. Behind those doors was the darkest side of Disney, a side that even I couldn't believe. Would Walt be in favor of what I'd seen? Or was it one of Eisner's ideas, intended to make money off his guests? Behind these doors was a dimly lit room carpeted with the same lush red velvet I'd seen in the hallway. The room was empty, with the exception of a small circular platform positioned in the center, surrounded by six leather armchairs, each with their own telephone and a card reader on a small table beside them. Inside, I, I knew what was going on. I knew what was happening here. This is one thing I will not cover up for the Disney Corp. I stood there in disbelief and horror and noticed a small door towards the back of the room. I went over and popped out the CC core, put it in my pocket and put in a Zone 1 core. That's when I heard someone clear their throat from the front of the room. It was Alan, armed with a gun which he had trained on me. He had a look of annoyance on his face. I slowly propped the door open on the latch and turned to face him. You never should have come here, he said as he approached me. So this is what you and your scumbag friends resorted to, I retorted. We did some pretty fucked up shit, Alan. 
but this is a new low for you and your disgusting friends. I had my hand at my side and blocked the view of me slipping the Zone 1 core out of the handle and into my pocket. It's not going to matter, because no one is going to find out. Alan raised the gun and like something out of an action movie, I ripped the door open as he pulled the trigger. I jumped backwards through the doorway and shut it behind me just in time to hear the bullet ping off the steel. I had both cores in my pocket, so I knew there was no way Alan could open the door. He was stuck. Realizing his predicament, he started shooting the door. Meanwhile, I moved forward, walking down a hallway with small cell-like rooms lining the corridor. Inside, I could see play school chairs and a few toys. I checked every single one of them, and they were all empty. I reached the end of the hall and came upon a huge metal vault-like door. I popped the last zone one core into the door to replace the CC core and pulled the steel door open and was promptly blinded by sunlight. I found myself outside alongside some utility road off-premises of Epcot leading off into the distance. I was too late. The kids were already gone for good. I called the police, but they never came. I called the FBI, but they never took me seriously. Hell, I even called the CIA, but they said they didn't deal with domestic issues like that and referred me back to the FBI. I showed up at the Orange County Police Department's headquarters and they took a report, but I heard something fall in the trash while I was leaving. If you go to a Disney park, please keep your kids close. Watch out for the men in the black polos. They may be monitoring you. They may be responding to something that will put you in danger. As far as I know, they aren't the ones that pick out the merchandise. I don't know who does that. But that doesn't really matter. Disney is good at what they do. They are good at keeping secrets and they are good at controlling any outside force that attempts to bring their secrets to light. I am lucky I saw the sunlight again and I am lucky to have had time to leave the state before they got to me. Not everyone is so lucky. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.